Well, 6 o'clock, I think we're good to go. I really appreciate you guys coming out today. I know uh, it's a beautiful day and we're not getting a lot of those lately, so I appreciate you taking the time to come out and learn a little bit more about brain health. This is a, a topic that I'm really passionate about and I, I see a lot of patients who are suffering with cognitive dysfunction and uh, it's just, it's running rampant through our, through our society and there's a lot we can do about it and that's what I'm hoping you can get out of today's talk is just how we can change the trajectory of Alzheimer's and cognitive decline by some lifestyle um, therapies as opposed to looking for the quick fix with the pill because we've done, there's been a lot of money spent on research for Alzheimer's pharmaceuticals and we're just, it keeps coming up short. So what we're finding through Dale Brenson, which we uh, I just mentioned there in that book, The End to Alzheimer's, is he's doing a lot of really cool research that's showing that with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, they're actually reversing cases of Alzheimer's through a functional approach, which means we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go through the talk, but by addressing why Alzheimer's is happening as opposed to just trying to stop it with a pharmaceutical, and that's what we're trying, we're gonna get into today. So my name is uh, Seth Osgood, and I'm the founder of Grassroots Functional Medicine, and um, I just, again, yeah, appreciate you being here. So I wanted to kind of put this home with a quick video just to put everything into perspective. It's a really cool video that's on the web. So you said you found out a bunch of crazy stuff today. Well, yeah, oh my God, I thought my husband was still living. No, where'd you think he was? Around. <laughs> truth that this is the reality for a lot of people and the number is growing. In fact, every 65 seconds someone in the United States is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And you know, in 2018 it was estimated there was almost 16 million cases, but this number is estimated to increase significantly over the next few years. In six years, it's going to increase, they're estimating, by 29%. And then by 2050, we're looking at 14 million cases. So you know, going from 5 million to 14 million by 2050, it's pretty significant. And again, there is no, at this point, there's no known cure or no effective treatment from a pharmaceutical standpoint. So we have to start digging outside of the box and thinking about this a little bit differently. It's the sixth leading cause of death right now. And 
beyond the emotional and the physical tax that it has on our society, there's a huge economical burden as well. As you can see, the cost in 2017 is $175 uh, billion for Medicare and Medicaid, and that's expected to jump to $758 billion by uh, 2050 again. So just, you know, it's getting out of control, and it's going to hurt, you know, our economy as well as the, our, life, our life. As you can see, the risk for Alzheimer's increases as we age. Um, you know, 65, we're at a 10% risk that goes to 25 by 75, and a 50% risk of Alzheimer's and dementia by age 85 years old. So, you know, the, the problem is, is that this doesn't just happen. This isn't something that pops up when you turn 65 or pops up when you're 75 or 85. It's a slow progression. So there is a lot of symptoms, that subtle symptoms that you can start to recognize you know, years and years before you get the diagnosis, and that's where we need to take action. That's where we need to start making changes to optimize and reduce our risk. So a lot of these symptoms, I mean, how many people know people who, or maybe you're suffering yourself, trouble remembering, remembering things, difficulty making decisions, problem solving, you know, slower thinking, mixing up words. This is happening to us more and more as we age, and unfortunately, it just gets thrown off as a normal part of aging. Now, of course, some of these things are okay to happen every once in a while, but when it starts to progress and get worse, that's when we have to really start taking it seriously. The truth is that a lot of times, you know, these are not just natural part of getting older. These are red flags. These are this, these symptoms are foreshadowing what may come. And of course, there's a lot of factors that can put you at an increased risk, which we're, we're going to talk about today. But you know, we have to again start taking action sooner. And if you do, your body can heal. The research is starting to show this. Dale Bredesen is, you know, that the end to Alzheimer's is doing some really fabulous research and actually showing Alzheimer's, uh, you know, halting and then actually regressing by taking this holistic, whole body approach. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. But the reality is, is you know, the sooner you act, the better the outcome. So, you know, you can sleep, you can think clearly into old age, you can hold on to those cherished memories, you can be fully present for you and your family, and you can even improve your brain health as you age. And that's, these are the things we need to be thinking about and working towards as opposed to just accepting the fact that we're getting older. So just a little bit about myself. So I um, grew up in, not too far from here, Corinth, Vermont, Chelsea, Vermont, not too far from here. And I was raised on a uh, organic dairy farm. My parents have a dairy farm. And uh, we, I grew up in a household where everybody had gut issues. Five out of the six of us were diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, that was our norm. My mom was the one who suffered the most. She's the one that was like a lot of my patients who had been to multiple doctors and had, uh, you know, just was trying to find some answers and was just given this blanket diagnosis of IBS and was told that, hey, this is your norm. This is what you're going to live with the rest of your life. Just rely on some of these medications. And this is life. So that's what we grew up doing, just living with, uh, you know, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So I remember, you know, the fights over ammonium AD and having the mad dashes to the bathroom. You know, th that was our life and what we considered normal. So what what changed is, you know, when I was actually getting ready to graduate from school, I got a phone call from my mom and she said, hey, you're not going to believe this, but uh, I just went and saw a doctor. She practices what's called functional medicine, and. Uh, and my IBS symptoms are gone. I feel I'm completely better. So I'm thinking to myself, after just completing conventional training, well, what did you take? Because I want some of that too. So, uh, so I asked her what she took, and she said, I didn't take anything. I actually changed my diet. She put me on an elimination diet, and she found out that I was allergic to several foods. So I was skeptical, because I was, had the mindset that we needed a drug to treat every, uh, every ailment. Uh, but I was desperate at the same time and sick of being sick. So I went on the same diet and found out that I had food sensitivities and my symptoms were gone. And my brother and my sisters did the same thing and their symptoms went away completely. Guess what we were uh, allergic to or guess what we had problems with? Dairy. Dairy. <laughs> so we grew up on a dairy farm and knew, knew what was frustrating about that is number one, I had never been taught that foods could cause problems with gut health. You know? And the second thing, it was just frustrating to me that that nobody really asked the question about what we were eating. And I always tell people, you know, when you bring your animal to the vet, the first thing they ask is, what are you eating? But yet when we go in, you know, nutrition is at the very back of the list when it comes to, uh, you know, chronic disease or health issues. So I was, at that point, I was just intrigued by this concept of functional medicine and go in head first, and, uh, and that's where I'm at today. 
So today what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about what functional medicine is and how it varies from a conventional approach. We're going to talk about neuroinflammation, which is a big piece of, of Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. And then we're going to talk about four root causes of um, cognitive issues. Of course, there's many. But and seven natural strategies, strategies that you can use to boost your brain health. So have you guys heard of functional medicine? Has everybody yeah. heard of functional medicine? So, you know, functional, hi, come on in. <laughs> so functional medicine uh, is a little bit different than the conventional model. You know, conventional medicine is absolutely phenomenal when it comes to acute care. So if you have an emergency, if you have an acute problem, you want to be in the hospital because the care is second to none. But where we're falling a little bit short is where, it, when it comes to preventative care and chronic disease management, and that's where functional medicine is trying to fill some gaps. So functional medicine is, is you know, geared towards trying to figure out why. That's really what it boils down to. Why are people getting sick? Why are these diseases starting? Where is this inflammation coming from? And by addressing the why, which is different for each person, we can, you know, we, we see some really amazing results because again, the body can heal as long as you're fueling it with the proper fuel and removing the triggers that are causing inflammation. Inflammation. The other big difference with what we do is it requires a partnership. This isn't simply you need to take a pill and you're done. It requires work and it requires lifestyle change and it requires dedication on your end, but the result is health. And, that, and that's what we're looking to really achieve through the functional approach. Anybody know who this is? <laughs> so what the heck does he have to do with this? So, the, uh, so Einstein, it's a really interesting story. So obviously he was a super smart guy, right? Known for his intelligence. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when he passed away, he, uh, a researcher, I think his name was Thomas Harvey, actually stole his, a piece of his brain to study it. So Einstein knew that he was going to be sought after. His brain was going to be sought after. And he wanted to be cremated. He didn't want anybody to be playing with his parts and studying his parts. But, uh, but um, Harvey actually stole a piece of his brain. He lost his job and he lost his reputation for it. But there were some very interesting findings. So what they theorized you know, back in that time frame was that yeah, he would have a lot more neurons. He would have a lot more electrical um, cells that to increase uh, you know, activity to help contribute to his intelligence. But when they compared his brain to the average human brain, the neurons were, were the same. There wasn't a significant difference. What they found is that he actually had uh, more glial cells in the area of his brain that was involved with critical thinking. So glial cells were originally thought just to be brain glue. You know, another one of those you know, things that were, they just thought it was there, didn't really have much of a role, just held things together. What they later found out is that this brain glue actually played a very significant, plays a very significant role with overall brain health. It plays a role with development, with metabolic function, with neuronal health, and then with intelligence uh, as well. So a lot of the things we're going to address today and talk about can actually be beneficial or be harmful to the glia, and this contributes to neuroinflammation, which is really at the root of a lot of cognitive decline issues. Another key concept to really understand uh, here is what a healthy set of neurons look like and what the neurons of an Alzheimer's brain look like. So as you can see on the left here, everything is very clean. Those, uh, you know, these extensions from these neurons, they send electrical impulses, they communicate with one another. But over here on the right, you see that there's, these neurons are blocked these, you know, by different things. And these are called um, tangles, tau tangles, and beta amyloid plaque. And those are two hallmark signs of Alzheimer's. The problem is, is you can't really see those unless you're doing an autopsy. So originally they thought, you know, let's try to create a drug that will fix this, that will stop the, uh, the beta amyloid and that will, that will work on these neurofibrillar tangles. And uh, again, they came up with, with, a, with a drug that act, when they found when they did address those, those problems, that the problem was still there, Alzheimer's was still there. What we now know and what they're learning about is the fact that the body is putting these, um, these beta amyloid plaques around the neuron to protect it from damage. So it's not, although the, the, the uh, plaque causes, blocks the signals and causes neuronal issues and death, it doesn't, it's not the root of Alzheimer's. The root of Alzheimer's are the problems that cause 
this, uh, these, this plaque to form. So by getting rid of the plaque, it doesn't do anything. We have to think about why is the plaque there and how do we prevent that, for, and how do we uh, you know, optimize the device so we can break it down. So beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles. Here's a, another problem with the brain is the fact that it, the brain itself doesn't have pain fibers. So when you have an issue with your brain, whether that's you know Alzheimer's or whether that's Parkinson's or whether that's MS or you know whatever is going on with your health, you're not going to feel pain, right? You don't have a headache, be, you know, because you, you don't get a headache when you're developing Alzheimer's because there's no pain receptors inside the brain. What you feel or what you know and how you know something's happening is by your symptoms. Okay, so the symptoms are what we have to be cognizant of. These are what we have to look out for. These are the red flags that tell us that something's going on that is you know, triggered by neuroinflammation. So neuroinflammation is the big player that causes destruction of brain cells and problems with cognitive function. So there's different levels of neuroinflammation here. As you can see, with mild neuroinflammation, a lot of us have been here, brain fog, mm -hmm. slow thinking, you know, re reduced endurance, sensitivities to chemicals and foods. A lot of people with brain inflammation, they walk down the cleaning aisle, the grocery store, and it's just too overwhelming for them. They have to leave because it's just too much stimulation. Now, if you step up into the moderate category, that's where you really have problems with depression and sleepiness and irritability, you know, the lethargy, the increased demand for sleep, where you need more and more sleep, but you still feel fatigued, you still feel tired. And then, of course, there's the severe where the symptoms get much more um, scary, right? Coma, delirium, seizures. And some people will, you know, have a, a mixture of all of these. So let's dive into some of the causes of cognitive decline, because these are things that you can address to help optimize your risk. So one of the big things is inflammation. Now inflammation is one of your body's natural processes to help it heal. So when you cut your hand, you're, you're going to get inflammation and that's gonna recruit the cells and recruit you know, white cells and red cells and platelets and, and different parts of your immune system so that healing can occur. Now inflammation is supposed to be acute. The problem is, is when it's a chronic issue, when it happens for a long period of time, that's when tissue damage and destruction starts to occur. And so we need to be thinking about the things that cause inflammation, and that can be a whole host of different things, which we're gonna go over a little bit more today. So one of the things that contributes to inflammation is infections, okay? And what is one of the more common infections that we run into here that uh, in, in the Upper Valley, or in the New England area that's running rapidly? out there calling all over the place now. Lyme disease, yeah. So you gotta watch out for Lyme disease because that's a big one these days. And unfortunately, I was talking to somebody today, you know, we grew up not too far from here. And when I was a kid, we didn't have any ticks. You know, we didn't have to worry about it. But now I'm literally picking ticks off of my kids every week. You know, so it, it's great. We live in Norwich where it's really bad, but um, we, but we're picking ticks off our kids all the time. And, and even last year, I tested several of them and they were negative, and this year they're positive. So you can send the ticks in to be tested, and I think that's a great idea, especially if you've been bitten. But it's something that we have to be careful of because these infections uh, can be a big problem, not only in the acute phase, but also in the chronic phase. And you can have you know, more than just Lyme disease. There's a lot of co-infections from ticks. You can get things from mosquitoes and from fleas. You, know, you can have gut infections, you can have fungal infections, you can have parasitic infections. There's a lot of bugs and critters out there that will tax your immune system and cause inflammation throughout your entire body, including in your brain. And there's been several studies where they've actually looked at Alzheimer's brains and found Lyme disease inside the brain. So along with other viruses like Epstein-Barr and different, different bugs. So, we have to be uh, cognizant of chronic infections and we have to, again, work to strengthen our immune system. That is key. And then deficiencies and imbalances is, is also very important. And uh, this is looking, so when you're looking at deficiencies, we're looking at nutritional deficiencies, uh, which is a big, you know, we do nutritional testing on almost everybody. And I haven't found a patient yet who's not deficient in something. So, you know, that this is the key part of this is fueling the body with what it needs to heal. So if you don't have those right nutrients, you know, if we're not consuming the right foods or we have gut imbalances that are inhibiting absorption of nutrients, then it's gonna set us up for failure in that healing process. And then imbalances are important too, specifically when we're looking at cognitive decline, hormones play a big role. So that's something that we'll talk a little bit more about. And then toxins. So for those of you who don't know, unfortunately our world is toxic, right? And uh, there's only so much we can do about it, but you have to protect yourself against toxins. This is key. 
And this is, can be mold. That's a big problem around here. I've seen a lot of people who suffer from mold toxicity. So, you know, especially with the basements and the humidity and the airtight houses that we're finding now, one water leak, small water leak, can lead to a big mold issue. So you have to be careful and you have to, you know, really seek this out and make sure uh, you're taking care of it because mold is toxic to your brain. We also know that uh, there is toxins in our food, right? You want to eat organic, you want to eat as clean as possible, but even the organic stuff, you got to be careful with. You need to clean it because it's sprayed with water that's often contaminated with, you know, different pesticides or herbicides. You know, glyphosate is a big one. So if you are in the habit of using Roundup around your house, do not do it. That is horrible. There's so much research coming out showing how glyphosate or Roundup is linked to all sorts of cancers and chronic diseases. They're even finding you know, glyphosate in the, in, in the cord blood of infants. So it is coming from mom and it's going to baby. Our infants, as soon as we come in, it's when we're toxic. And then we're exposed to all sorts of other things. So we're gonna talk about ways that you can optimize your risk and reduce your toxic load. One of the big toxins to talk about when it comes to cognitive dysfunction is alcohol. So alcohol is, uh, you know, a lot of people drink alcohol, and you know, there's some research suggesting that there is benefits for certain things, but when it comes to cognitive decline or brain dysfunction, we know that it's inflammatory and is not your friend. So if you have any sign of cognitive issues, you really need to cut out the alcohol. It might make you feel good in the short term, but realistically, in the long term, it does lead to inflammation. That's why a lot of people, you know, that's another sign that they're toxic, that their body's overloaded, is they can't have a glass of wine anymore because it gives them a huge headache and they feel sick for days. You know, that is not good. That means that it is triggering an inflammatory response in your brain and you have to be careful. And then I have to mention before Roundup, you know, this is the stuff that is no good and it's a huge problem in our society and it's everywhere. You know, it's in the rain, it's in the soil. You know, so that's what you just got to be really careful. So let's jump into some of those strategies to help your body heal and improve uh, brain health. I wanted to tell you guys, so on that sheet I handed around, we've got a brain, uh, a, I made a guide for you, which kind of goes into more. Oh yeah, more yeah, I think they're over here, yeah. So the link, there's a link on the bottom there, but I made a guide to make it so you can bring this home and read more about it and get more tips on how to be successful. Because you know, you in the community, you guys are the ones who are gonna spread the word and really get people to the next level. So I encourage you to share this with your friends, you know, uh, share it with your family, and really start incorporating some of these strategies because they can be a game changer. They can be a game changer. So, you know, again, it's really going in depth on you know eating for brain health, detoxifying your home optimizing your sleep and mindset. So the first thing is optimizing your diet. This is the most inflammatory component of most people's life is their nutrition. And unfortunately, our food is bombarded by processed foods and, and excessive carbohydrates, unhealthy fats, nutrient deplete food. So we have to be figuring out what diet is best. You know, and it's not always about what diet is sexy for the day. It's a figuring out what diet is good for you because I've seen people, I had a guy the other day who we reintroduced almonds and he had a colitis flare, you know, where they put him in the hospital. So we know that there's certain, just like you hear about kids dying from a peanut allergy. I mean, anything is possible. So you really have to individualize it and you have to figure out what diet plan is gonna be right for you. But what we know is that eating lots of, you know, a plant-based diet with lean protein and healthy fats is really what you wanna be sticking to. And of course, you want your food to be as clean as possible. Ideally, you want it to be organic. And for those of you who don't know, there's a great resource called the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen on ewg.org, and that is a uh, website that's really good for a lot of health tips, but what, it, what it, that Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen is telling you what 15 foods you can get away with, typically not buying organic, and which 12 foods you always want to buy organic because they're the highest okay. on the type of toxicity. ewg.org. EWG. Yep, it's a great, and they got all sorts of resources on there. Mm -hmm. Environmental Working Group. So one of the things that I like to start people on to really figure out what is what foods are problematic for them is an elimination diet. And depending on where you are in your journey, journey, there's different levels of aggressiveness. But there's various benefits to doing an elimination diet. You know, again, the fact that there's no calorie restriction, you're reducing your toxic burden, you are eating foods that are high in phytonutrients, 
and you're reducing inflammation. So sometimes we'll put people on a strict elimination diet and sometimes we'll get rid of one or two foods and that's okay, you have to do what works for you, but you wanna start somewhere. If you're going to eliminate three foods, uh, the top three you wanna get rid of for a short period of time or ever, whatever, when you decide to do is you know, sugar, Sugar is very inflammatory, gluten and dairy. And I know a lot of people hear about gluten, but I tell you, it is a big problem for a lot of people, but you don't know until you get rid of it completely and then add it back in. But you know, some people need to get rid of you know, nuts and seeds and nightshades and legumes and various other things that can be inflammatory, but I highly recommend at least doing some form of elimination diet if you haven't, because it can be a game changer. So many conditions I've seen improve uh, or completely vanish by simply eliminating some inflammatory foods. And I think a lot of it, I don't think it's that the food was causing the big problem. I think that it's just another trigger of inflammation that you know increases the inflammatory load. And the more, think of it as a bathtub that's just overflowing. And the more we can drain out that water with different mechanisms, the better we're gonna be for it, the healthier we're gonna be and the less inflammation we're gonna have. But elimination diet is very, powerful. When we're looking at brain health, we want to focus in on healthy fats and nutrient-dense foods. So a lot of people have probably heard about the ketogenic diet. Now, the ketogenic diet is, again, one of those sexy diets that's out there right now everybody's doing and talking about. And I don't think it's good for everybody. And you have to be careful when you do get on the keto diet diet and watch your lab values, watch your lipids, watch your inflammatory markers, watch your liver function. But when it comes to cognitive dysfunction and uh, you know brain issues, it can be a game changer. So this can be really good with when it comes to Alzheimer's or cognitive decline. You just gotta work with somebody to help you tweak it and make sure everything looks good because there's nothing out there that's perfectly safe. You wanna make sure balance is key. And then another question I always get are, what are the top supplements or nutraceuticals that I need to take for brain health? And because I you know all people literally come into my office and they'll have a grocery bag full of supplements, you know, and that happens a lot because people just want to feel better and they read about supplements and they see the benefits, but you can go crazy and you can go broke taking supplements. So what you want to do is figure out an individualized routine that works for you. And, uh, and when it comes to brain health, there's a couple of things that you can look at. So as according to the research, these are some of the supplements that are you know, the top players when it comes to cognitive decline. Resveratrol and, cur and uh, curcumin, uh, which is a derivative of turmeric. You guys have probably heard that. These are excellent when it, the polyphenols when it comes to brain health. Essential fatty acids. You know, DHA is more is is a better fat for cognitive dysfunction, but EPA is really good for inflammation and immune function. So you know, make sure you're on a good fish oil, but more importantly, make sure you're eating the foods that are high in these fats. So we call it. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, you're not. If you're not eating, if you're not eating fish, if you're on a non Good question. Yeah, yeah. So I have a lot of patients who are vegetarians or vegans, and if we are uh, trying to supplement them, we look at numbers to see where they're at, but if they need supplementation, a lot of times I'll use an algae-based supplement that works really well. They just need to take more of them to get where you need to be, but it does get the job done. But you want to remember the smash fish, okay? Smash fish are high in omegas. So salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Okay, those are some really good ones that are high in the omega-3s that you want to focus in on. Um, and then short-chain fatty acids, this is kind of a newcomer to um, the field, you know, things like butyrate. And these come from actually your gut flora. When you eat resistant starch foods, things like you know, raw oats, um, tiger nuts, green bananas, plantains, potatoes that have been cooked and cooled, those are all resistant starch foods. And what happens is your good flora will gobble them up, and as a byproduct, it puts off short-chain fatty acids, which play a, they're like fuel for the cells in your gut. They play a big role with gut health, but they're also crucial for brain health. Uh, and then magnesium, you can't get enough magnesium. That's good stuff when it comes to uh, you know, brain health. There's a, a supplement called magnesium threonate that crosses the blood-brain barrier and is really good for brain inflammation. And then antioxidants like glutathione. Glutathione is also very good at quenching oxidative stress and inflammation. Short-chain fatty acid, that'd be like MCT oil? No, that's not. It's a great question. So. Short-chain fatty acids are the, the butyrate, acetate, and propionate. So they either get them from a supplement or you get them from eating resistant starch foods. So say that again. Say those 
cool potatoes. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, so you cook raw oats. Raw oats, like if you put them in a the smoothie, they can, they're a great resistant starch. Um, tiger nuts, if, a lot of people don't know what tiger nuts are, but those are a great resistant starch and they're a good snack. So it's not a nut, it's actually from a root, but it, it's a good snack that's quick and you can get tiger nut flour as well, that works. Bananas that are on the green side, you don't want the, 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 raw, the ripe bananas full of sugar. You get them a little on the green side, they're a better resistant starch. Plantains as well. If you just Google, you know, uh, you know, resistant starch foods, there's a bunch of them out there. But those are the things that really help optimize your gut health, uh, and they're great for brain health as well. We raw know oats as in rolled oats. Right? Yes, Not yes, yeah. yes. You got it. You got it. <laughs> so. Yeah, what, what, what the, the resistant, what are these? Resistant, resistant starches. And then the other question I have is magnesium, what was the supplement? Magnesium 3 and 8. Now there's all sorts of different magnesium. Spell it. Uh, T-H, I'm a horrible speller. T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E, I think is what it is. Okay. So there's various forms of magnesium. Some are really good for your brain. Some are really good for bowel movements. Some are really good for joint, and, or for muscle aches. And then magnesium threonate is really good for you know, the brain. Uh, but with magnesium too, I mean, you can't overdo everything. So there's nothing that you can just take a bunch of and be up completely safe. You have to get your levels checked. You have to make sure you're not overdoing it. But magnesium threonate works really good for sleep as well because of its calming effect. So the reason where this picture is coming from is, uh, has anybody heard of type three diabetes? Yeah. Right, so that's what they're calling, some people are calling Alzheimer's is type three diabetes because the strong association between diabetes and cognitive decline and brain issues. So when you're a diabetic, for, and this happens for various reasons, but one, there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of oxidative stress because sugar is inflammatory. So, you know, you have small vessels inside your brain, so when those become damaged, just like that can happen in your kidney or in your heart, you can get reduced blood flow. When you have reduced blood flow, you can have many strokes, and that can lead to cognitive decline. So diabetes is no joke. That is one of the things that we have to be aggressive about treating and getting under control. And, and beyond just taking a medication to make your numbers look good, you have to make the lifestyle changes that actually fix why the problem is there to begin with. Because the, just making the numbers look good is not, not necessarily changing the inflammatory response. So you want to, again, take that whole body approach. What numbers are you talking about? For diabetes? What, like checking your blood sugar? Your your yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it depends on where your numbers are at. But uh, some people have diabetes or pre-diabetes uh, or insulin resistance. Um, so this enzyme here is called insulin degrading enzyme. And what th why this is important is because this its job, its primary job is to break down insulin, OK? What else does this do? It also breaks down beta amyloid plaque. So remember that previous slide that showed you know, Alzheimer's brain with the, the tangles, the tau tangles, and the beta amyloid plaque? Well, this enzyme actually helps break down the plaque, which is awesome. Again, the body was, is, is just such a magnificent design, and it can fix itself. The problem with this enzyme is that it can't do two things at once very efficiently. So when you have diabetes and your insulin levels are high, and your insulin, one of the jobs of insulin is to help you know, mobilize sugar into the cells so it doesn't cause problems, there's various things that it does. But when you have a high insulin, because you're eating high, a lot of carbohydrates or a high sugar diet, you use all of your insulin degrading enzyme to break down the insulin, and there's not much left over to break down that amyloid plaque. So again, you know, it's just, you really, getting that blood sugar under control is super important. Another big thing you need to focus in on is re reducing stress. Now, who's not stressed these days? Everybody's stressed for one reason or another. But there is legitimate um, pathological changes that happen in the brain from increased stress. One of the areas that gets, um, that gets affected is your hippocampus, which is important for memory. Okay, so what is one of the big problems with Alzheimer's is losing your memory. So high stress, and we've all experienced this, when you're under high stress, you have more of those brain parts, those brain cramps, right? So we need to be careful about monitoring our stress, not only being reactive to it when it's high, but being preventative. You know, deep breathing, meditation, prayer, acupuncture, massage, go out and go for a walk, sit in the grass and ground. There's lots of things that you can do and, and the other thing is getting out of toxic relationships. You know, if you have a job that you hate and, it's, and it stresses you out, you need to do something different. If you're in a relationship that is horrible and you're stressed out every time you're around your friend or your spouse, 
You need to fix that. Whether that's counseling or whether it's getting out, you can't be, these toxic stressors will destroy you. And we see this not only with cognitive decline, we see it with autoimmunity, we see it with cancers, we see it with all these things where people go through this major stressful event and now they're sick. And that's not coincidence. Something is changing with your physiology from that stress response. It suppresses your immune system, it wears down your brain, it, you know, it, it destroys your gut. There's so many negative things for stress uh, that stress causes. So you need to address that and make that a top priority. And that's probably one of the hardest things for people to change. You know, They come into the clinic and they will eat the right diet, they'll take the right supplements, they'll even do an exercise regimen, which is awesome. But sometimes people will not fix the stress and they, they fail to improve to their full extent because of that. So it needs to be on the top of the list. And it makes sense, right? That's usually the reason why people get sick. So we need to make that the top priority to get you better. Sleep is another big one. And this is a stressor to your body. So stress is not just emotional. It can be physical. It can be toxic. You know, that same response will follow, cause that same cascade. Uh, for multiple reasons, but sleeping is huge. You need to get enough sleep. Uh, you know, at least seven to eight hours. But listen to your body and do what do what it needs. You know, and ideally we we want to be adopting a healthy sleep hygiene. So many people are on sleep medications nowadays uh, just to go to bed. But there's so many things you can do naturally to optimize this. One of the biggest things: shut your phone off. You know, so many people are addicted to their phone. They're on their phone all night long. It's right by their bed. It's going off. The alerts are on, you know, and then you've got Wi-Fi and EMFs. There's various things there that are concerning. But, you know, shut your phone off. Shut your screens off at least a couple hours before you before bed. And set, set yourself up for success. You can get some blue light glasses that are really effective at helping your brain calm down. You can meditate or pray or deep breathe before bed. Take a hot bath. There's so many things. In nine times out of ten, those basic maneuvers, even though it may be a little bit challenging at first, can be really effective. How do you measure the quality of your patient's sleep? That's a great question. So there's all sorts of ways to do that now, and there's not a perfect method in all, in all honesty. So you know, some people will wear the Fitbits or the, the different tracking devices, which I think have some value. Um, there, then there's sleep studies that you can do now where you can actually do an at-home sleep study. The sleep studies in the sleep centers, I just don't really agree with those because it's not a good environment to get restful sleep. But now you can actually do those sleep studies at home. So, you know, in all honesty, though, it's at talking to the patient and asking them and, and asking their spouse or their partner as well just to gauge where they're at. And people are usually pretty good about it, but as far as how they're sleeping and the quality of sleep and what type of sleep they're getting. It's a little bit tricky. It's what a are great blue question. light glasses? Uh, blue light glasses, you can get them on Amazon or amber glasses. They've got like a tinted lens, so the blue light from screens, like on your phone or your computer, doesn't wake your brain up like it would if you were just looking at and it. And you wear them when you go to bed? So yeah, you wear them before bed. So usually, you know, we're supposed to be, I, I believe that we're supposed to be rising and setting with the sun. So, you know, at night when the sun's going down, that's when you would want to put on your blue light glasses and set, you know, if you're going to watch TV or if you're going to do some kind of work. Where do you get them? Uh, Amazon, you can get them on Amazon. They're actually not very expensive. Blue light glasses? Blue light glasses, yeah. So you're saying wear those just when you're looking at screens before then? I think it's, it's good in general. Around the house. Unless you, no, I think it's great around the house too, is because a lot of people have their lights on, right? We're trying to get the brain to calm down. So even a little bit of tin, and you can set your phones to have, to have blue light too, not that I encourage you to be on your phone, but there are settings so it dims at night as, the, as you get closer to bed. So it's better than nothing. So this is another cool finding in the recent years. It's called the lymphatic system. So originally we thought that the lymphatic system, which is an important part of immune function and drainage of toxins, wasn't in your brain. It was just throughout your entire body. But they recently found that, you know, not too long ago, that it's actually in the brain. So this is where the, the glia, which are those cells I talked about before, detoxify and cleanse themselves. This is a big part of that. So if we are going to, where did, when, does this, when is this the most active? It's at night when you're sleeping. So that's why, again, we have to be prioritizing sleep. If we want the brain to recover, we need to get a restful night's sleep and figure out how to make that happen. And then movement, right? We have to move. We are a sedentary society. You know, our, we are at work all day, at the desk. I'm just as guilty as anybody. You know, sitting down and consulting with patients all day. But you have to make extra time to get up and move and exercise. And uh, 
you know, so exercise does so many different things for the brain. And this is all backed by research. So it increases neurotropins like BDM, BDNF, which is important for cell repair and recovery. It, it decreases inflammation, it restores glial cells, and it enhances neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So it enhances the communication between neurons in the routes that they take. And there's proven evidence that, again, it reduces cognitive decline. So we have to make exercise part of our daily routine. I always tell people, you know, with, with all of my patients, there's five things that need to happen for you to get well. You need to eat the right food, you need to sleep, you need to move, you need to relax, and we need to focus in on detox. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you're not addressing those foundational elements, a lot of the other stuff doesn't really matter as much. So you're going to get so much more benefit and so much more uh, recovery, and a quicker recovery, by prioritizing those foundational five things. So when we're looking at exercise, you know, you have to, with cognitive decline, we know that there is the right amount. You know, high intensity training, is, is one of the more beneficial things for, for brain health, but you can overdo it. So you hear a lot of people doing CrossFit where they probably shouldn't be doing CrossFit or some of these high intensity interval trainings and they wear themselves out. So you've got to work with somebody to figure out what's the best routine and what's the best plan of action for you where you're getting benefit, but you're not overtraining and losing the, the benefit from what you're doing. And then balance hormones. So hormones, there's various hormones, and a lot of people have hormone imbalance. So you've got adrenal hormones, you've got thyroid hormones, you've got sex hormones. All of these things need to be looked at and they need to be um, evaluated because they're very, very important for, again, your body to fight, for your body to heal, and your body to recover. They actually did a study, I think it was at the Mayo Clinic, and they, they, set, they found that women, when they had their ovaries removed before 40, had twice the risk for developing Alzheimer's. So we know that, that the estrogen and the testosterone and the progesterone, there's a benefit to these hormones. They just have to be, you know, they, they have to be balanced appropriately. And that's not saying everybody needs to go out and get out of hormones, but it, you know, there's ways that you can even optimize those naturally. But again, we know specifically estrogen and testosterone, even in women, there is benefit to the brain and the best benefit for immune function. And I have a lot of people, a lot of women specifically, who get sick uh, you know, with autoimmune conditions or various other conditions at puberty, pregnancy, or at menopause. And that just, again, goes to show how important those hormones are and how they all need to be balanced. And then we need to focus in on, again, detoxing. And I know I talked a little bit about this before, but this is such a big, big piece of the puzzle. You know, uh, one of the things we need to detox from or make sure we're evaluating for that often gets overlooked are heavy metals. You guys, have you guys seen this movie? <laughs> so this is the Mad Hatter, right? So uh, Mad as a Hatter. Does anybody know where Mad as a Hatter came from? And they used mercury. Exactly. So when the, these Hatters used to use mercury, I guess, to take fur off the skin. And what they found is a lot of them went crazy. So the mercury and the neurotoxicity that it caused caused all sorts of bad things to happen, you know? And it caused neuroinflammation, which leads to cognitive decline. So they, we, they you know, coined that term, mad as a hatter, and it's still around today. Um, so we have to be thinking about heavy metals and evaluating our environment because we do have them. You know, a lot of people have mixed metal amalgams uh, where there's actually mercury in their mouth, you know, from the fillings, and we, we call them, you know, silver fillings, which sounds really nice and friendly, but there's more mercury in there typically. So, you know, again, we have to be aware of that. Some people have a problem with it and some people don't, but if they're reaching out in your system, they can be toxic. You know, we get metal from certain supplements. There's metals in water and lead pipes. So we have to be, again, cognizant. It's not that everybody has a problem with this, but you have to be thinking about it and looking for it, because what we're trying to do are fill those gaps and plug those holes that are triggering an inflammatory response. So what do we do when we're dealing with detox? I always tell people that there's, there's what you need to do. You need to pee, you need to poop, you need to sweat, and you need to breathe. That is how you remove toxins from your body. Pee, poop, sweat, and breathe. So we need to stay hydrated. We need to be constantly voiding. You know, you want your, your pee to be light yellow. You don't want it to be too dark. You don't want it to be too clear, but you want to stay hydrated. A good rule of thumb is half your weight uh, in ounces. So if you're, you know, 160 pounds, you want to be drinking at least 80 ounces of water a day. That's a good rule of thumb. Of course, that'll vary depending on the person. But hydrate. 
Yeah, half your weight in ounces. So if you weigh, if <laughs> so, you know, you just gotta be, you gotta be cognizant and watch your urine and make sure it's happening. But hydration is a big problem for a lot of people. So keep up with the fluid. That's how you flush your system. That's very important. You know, again, gut health. You guys have probably all heard about the importance of gut health. We know how crucial the microbiome is. Now we're learning more and more every day. You need to have a healthy gut to have a healthy body. So, you know, pooping is important. I talk to some people and they'll say that they have a bowel movement a couple times a week. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. You know, you need to be moving your bowels. Pooping stakes is what I tell people you want to look for. You want to be pooping stakes at least one to two times a day. If you're not doing that, you need to address that. You need to change that because that's one of the big ways. Again, you eliminate toxins from your body. You say a snake? Deep, yeah, poop in a snake. What kind of snake? <laughs> <laughs> a long, like round, it. soft snake. <laughs> like a so garter snake? Like a, a milk snake. Right? <laughs> Got a milk, yeah. Okay. So if you look online, there's a thing called a Bristol stool chart, which is a chart to tell you how you should be pooping, essentially. <laughs> so it, it, it's funny, I just have a coffee cup with Bristol stool chart on it. But it was, you know, goes from being the rabbit pellets, which is really constipated, to being liquid, which is diarrhea. You want to be somewhere in the middle, and that's a good reference you know, it's a good rule of thumb to, to check out. So make sure you have a healthy gut. If you have gas, if you have bloating, if you have constipation or diarrhea, that needs to be addressed. You need to fix that, especially if you're dealing with cognitive issues or any chronic health issues. The, the, a lot of people don't know this, but 80% of your immune system resides in your gut, which is a pretty awesome design because, again, most of the junk we put in our body comes through our mouth. It also controls 90% of serotonin production, which is very important for mood and for energy. A lot of people, when they're depressed or have anxiety, they're put on SSRI, which it, you know recycles the serotonin in their body, so it's higher. But if we fix the gut, a lot of times the mood improves as well. So we, we have to be focusing on the gut, and also, again, you know, it's important for the digestion and absorption of all your nutrients. And a lot of times when we have a, a leaky gut, probably people have heard, you've heard that concept, leaky gut. When you have a leaky gut or intestinal permeability, which is backed by research, it's just not a fruit loop term. When you have a leaky gut, you have often have a leaky brain. So those two are always talking to one another. And a lot of times when you eat a food that's not good for you, or you feel gassy and bloated, you feel it in your brain, you feel tired, you have brain fog, you just don't feel well. So we have to understand all of our systems are connected, which is why we have to look at the big picture and not just be focusing on individual systems or individual specialties. Every time we address something in the body, we have to be thinking about what is the consequence, what is the reaction. That's super important. So get the right testing. This is also important. I kind of mentioned this before with the, um, with the supplements. Again, you can go crazy and broke with the supplements, and you can go crazy with guessing. So, you know, testing, if you get the right testing, you know, you want to talk to your doctor about some of these things and see if you can get some clarity on what's really going on. Because otherwise, you're going to be just struggling, chasing your tail, and going after the wrong thing. I mean, there's a chance you might hit it, but when you're dealing with cognitive decline or you're dealing with brain health issues, you want to jump on this thing as fast as you can. You want to get the right information so you can make the right steps and, and get you to the, the best outcome possible. So, you know, again, looking at your thyroid, looking at your hormones, looking at your nutrients, looking at, you know, uh, you, you know all your inflammatory markers, looking at your gut health, all of this stuff can be really helpful to get you to uh, the best health possible. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You said before um, that uh, deficiencies mm -hmm. are important. If I were going to the doctor, if I had an appointment coming up, what deficiencies do I look for? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the basic ones, you know, that you would want to look at, vitamin D, you know, vitamin A, uh, vitamin E, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, you know, magnesium, those are some of the, the more common ones that you can look at. You're really looking at antioxidants, which combat oxidative stress, which is a big piece of cognitive function. You want to boost immune health as well. So there's lots of different things you can look at. Is there a panel that you like that covers the most? So we do, a, it's tricky because we do a lot of, we do different tests typically depending because there's better tests for different deficiencies, you know, like, um, we use actually a, an organic acid test for urine, for that's a urine test uh, for nutrient deficiencies because that does more than look at what's in your blood. It's telling you what's happening more so on the cell level. Because just because it's in your blood or just because you know, you're consuming high amounts doesn't mean you're absorbing it intracellularly 
which is what you really need to know. That's where you know where you get the most bang for your buck. But there's just there's a lot of different ones you can do. It's a good question. What is the inflammatory marker? That's a good one. So. So a great inflammatory, there's a bunch of them out there as well, you know, but a basic one that you can go look at is high sensitivity C-reactive protein or high sensitivity CRP. Uh, ESR is another great inflammatory marker, which is a sedimentation rate. Uh, and then there's various markers that you can look at, even from basic blood panels, which we call acute phase reactants. And that's just a fancy way of saying, when you have inflammation, they're going to be high. So like, uh, for example, you know, Platelets will often go up, and that's in a CVC, when you have a lot of inflammation. Or ferritin, which is a great marker for iron storage, will go up when you have a lot of inflammation. So even some of these basic labs can be useful. In, in, in Bredesen's book, there's like 36, and he goes into a bunch, yeah. as to what each of those. Exactly, exactly. It's a great, that's a great resource that uh, ends all Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of stuff in there, you know, just finding a doctor who's going to work with you and help you order those tests. but And then there's more advanced functional tests they can do, like looking at oxidative stress markers and, and you know gut inflammation markers and various things you can look at. But that's a great resource of looking at what he's got in the book. He lists the functional that book? An End to Alzheimer's by Dale so Bredesen. do you work with all these tests? Yeah, yep, yep. We, we, our patients are typically pretty sick, so you know we, we really do a lot of testing and to get a good understanding of, of what's going on to get them to that endpoint faster. Mm -hmm. But you know, so just to kind of recap some of this stuff, you know, you gotta. What I really hope you take home from this is that you gotta jump on this sooner rather than later. You know, of course, when you're dealing with this, you still can make progress, you still can see improvement, but we have to shift our mindset as. From waiting until it's there and then addressing it to preventing it. You know, prevention is key. So if you're seeing some of these subtle symptoms of cognitive decline, whether it's the memory lapses or the brain fog, or you know, difficulty finding words, or you know, you're not able to perform at work like you did before, or accomplish the tasks that you once could do, you need to be trying to implement some of these things to maximize your brain health and reduce your risk for deterioration. Prevention is your strongest defense. You don't want to procrastinate. procrastinate. And I always tell people, you know, less than optimal is not normal. So don't accept, I hate, you're just getting older. I hear that all the time. You're just getting older. The symptoms just from getting older. That's not acceptable. That's, that's, that's giving up in my mind. You know, you want to be thinking about why this is happening. Whether you're, you know, 32 years old or 99 years old, you can improve your health and you can feel better. But you've got to make changes. You've got to do something different. Your body can heal. And you know, again, if you just fuel it with the right nutrients and you remove those into the triggers, as Bredesen talks about in his book, I think there's 36 different holes that he talks about you need to look at and you need to fill. Everybody's got different holes. Everybody needs different treatment. It's not a standard process. You can't go, it's not cookie cutter like you'll see on most medical you know, treatment plans where you do this, you do this, you do this, it doesn't work, you do this, you do this. You have to be individualized because that's where you're going to get the best results. Because you know we shouldn't be going around from doctor visit to doctor visit when we're in our you know our, you know in our later years. We should be enjoying our life. We work hard. You know that's what you want to be focused on is being healthy. You want to be there for your grandkids. You want to see your children grow up. So you have to you know take action now. You have to make the changes that you need to make. Uh, you know because it's possible. So again, you know. Every 65 seconds, someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's. You know, you don't have to be that statistic, but to make to, to, to beat this thing, you have to start making changes because what you should be is happy. Everybody should be happy, right? We don't want we want to be happy up until the last days of our life. You know, and that is what is important. So remember this guide. Check it out again. Just some tips in there on how to eat cleaner, how to detoxify your home, which is huge and how to optimize your sleep and your mindset. So I really, really appreciate you guys coming in and hanging out. I know it's a beautiful night out there and it's just inspiring to see people wanting to increase their knowledge, increase their education because that is what's gonna change the future of healthcare, it's you guys. So uh, again, I'm just really grateful for that and uh, I'll be coming back in the future hopefully and doing some more talks. But does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. What do you think about the, there's a lot of apps out there for brain. Ah, good, yes. That's, I like those. I yeah. like those. I use those quite often actually with my patients. I just 
uh, told two about it today. Luminosity is what yes, I typically refer to. So remember, we exercise our uh, body to keep our muscles strong and keep, keep our circulation uh, moving efficiently. We also have to exercise our brain. So don't never stop learning. You know, find things that you love. The, some of those apps are really good about, uh, you know, again, enhancing memory, enhancing those, if, the, the firing of those neurons, and that's what's going to keep your brain going. So, you know, pick up new things that you love. Learn to play an instrument. Play memory with your children or your grandchildren. You know, do different things that's going to stimulate your brain and some, some great technology out there, too, to help you do that. Can I ask you about this book a friend one just said to me? Brain food. I haven't read that. No. Awesome. I'll have to read that. Need some more So, if I came to you as a, as a, a client, yeah. and um, wanted to, you, you wanted to do a whole bunch of tests, mm -hmm. uh, are all these tests going to be covered by Medicare? It Actually, so it depends, right? So it depends. That's a good question because it is an investment with the testing, and uh, but. Believe it or not, the best insurance to have, which is awesome, is Medicare for a lot of these tests. They get a lot of them get 100% coverage, which is great. I mean, not all of them, but, uh, but Medicare does get really good coverage. So, um, and you want to test specifically? Like the nutrition profile gets covered, the stool test gets covered. Um, there's various things. Medicare is great. You know, they're leading the way with a lot of this stuff, which which is awesome. Which, you know, whereas some of the other insurance companies aren't as good. So. So I've got a location in Burlington and in uh, West Lebanon, New Hampshire. You do have a place in Burlington? Where is it? Yeah, it just opened up. Yep. IDX Drive. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, for the elimination diet, mm -hmm. how long do you have to eliminate the food? At least, I tell people 30 days. So 30 days is a good starting point. The research, you know, somewhere between three weeks and, th and, and a month before your antibody levels come down enough to where you're going to get a response that's sufficient when you reintroduce the food. Okay, so if you cheat on an elimination diet, even a little bit, you're not gonna have that exaggerated response if you do have in, an inflammatory food that you put back in. So it is important when you do an elimination diet, be strict, you know, be 100% for ideally 30 days. I think that's a good starting point. And then, so you see how you feel after the 30 days and then yeah. put the food back. Exactly. And see how you feel then. Sure. So typically, you you know, what I, there's different ways to do it, but what I usually recommend is you eat the food just a small amount three times on one day, and then you wait a couple of days to see how you feel. You know, without the food. So you eat it, kind of load your system, and see how it reacts. If you have any change of symptoms from your baseline where you were going into the food reintroduction, then you know that that food is not good for you right then. It doesn't mean you have to be off of it forever, but you want to eliminate it at least until you keep your gut in a better place and your inflammation. And then once your symptoms settle down, if you did have a reaction, then you can move on to introducing the next food. So the nutritional profile, going back to that, this blood test, mm -hmm. and then... So urine tests, we, there's different ways you can do it. So there's various testing. You can look at blood, you can look at urine, um, you know, some people even look at hair. There's uh, various, various ways to test. I use urine and blood a lot, because uh, I find it more reproducible, but everybody's different. So, and then this tells you what you're lacking? Yes. Yep, it tells you what you're deficient in or and what you're sufficient in. So, you know, again, and what we always want to push is the foods that are high in those nutrients because that's what where we want to get you. Sometimes we use supplements in the beginning to get your levels up, but the goal is to always be getting your nutrition from food. Uh, to, you know, and, and so sometimes it's hard to do. Yes? I was a little late and I don't know if you covered this at all. Have you talked at all about um, different probiotics? Yeah, we didn't really get into that. So probiotics are very interesting because I think this, still the jury's out on what's the best for each person. So and we just don't have the answers yet. You know, I think, again, getting back to the foods that are fermented, you know, the prebiotics, the resistant starch food, I always think that that is your best bet. Some people are just in the place where, where their gut's not healthy enough to tolerate certain prebiotics or resistant starches. But I, I personally like to rotate and do different things. I'm a big fan of spore-forming probiotics, um, which are soil-based, typically. And But there's a lot of stuff out there. You just gotta be careful, because the supplements, they're not all created equal. They're not regulated, so you just gotta make sure you know, you know, I always recommend getting them from like a compounding pharmacy or directly from the manufacturer, because you don't know how long they've been sitting, you don't know the environment they've been sitting in. You just gotta be careful. But rotation, if you don't know, just doing different ones and seeing how you feel is a good play. But again, getting back to the food is always the priority. Yeah? Well, I have a friend who's in her late 70s, and she was part 
of a drug study. This mm -hmm. is a true story at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And she didn't know at first if she was in the placebo group or she was getting the yeah. drug. But she, a couple, I think a couple of days into this study, she realized that something was different in her brain. This mm -hmm. is a true story. Yeah. And she went through the study, and then she found out later that she was getting the drug that they were experimenting. Yeah. And it turned out to be an amino acid, and I was with l Yeah. And we yeah. are going into a lot of detail. Searing. Searing, yeah. S-E-R-I-N-E. Yep. Um, and she had had a lot of like brain fog problems. I mean, yeah. dif difficult. Uh, Whatever the tests are done, she was told in no uncertain terms the last time I spoke to her that her Alzheimer's had gone away. Oh, and I, I don't, I have a lot, yeah. no risk with the computer, but it seemed to be, there's more to it, it had to be, what yeah. call, anyway. It's interesting though, because you know, the, I wonder if you see, know, I have heard of that. Not with Alzheimer's yeah. actually, I had a patient from Dartmouth who was on it for um, the Derrick's disease. They were trying right. to have, didn't really right. see any benefit, but they were doing some research, and I didn't didn't see the end result of that, you know. Like, but again, what's interesting about it is that it's an amino acid. It's just it was right. just an amino acid. So. But with that said, she's on the strict protocol. Yeah, yeah. Getting forty minutes of it, I, diet and everything. Right, but right. Yeah. Whatever the tests are that determine, you know, that Alzheimer's is gone. It, it had gone away. Yeah, yeah. So really, it's diagnosed so, mainly based on clinical presentation. So that's what they're seeing, right. though, is that it's you know people are getting better. They're getting, they're going, improving their yeah. cognitive function. They're improving their memory by taking this full body approach. And honestly, right. we don't know what works for everybody, you right. know. But we do, have, we do it all just because when you're losing your memory, and, you know, or you're losing your cognitive function. You want to take that full on approach to get better. So the exercise, the sleep, the nutrition, you know, the supplements, and, and that's that's what Bredesen is seeing. Again, focusing on each person as an individual and but taking a very comprehensive approach to what's getting people better. And it's very intriguing. And we're learning so much. I mean, we we still will be learning for years and years. You know, we did definitely nobody has all the answers. So it's what you gotta do. You know, just try. I have this problem where if I take anything like algae, and just recently I took plankton. Yeah. And after about two days of taking it, my brain just go, I mean, I just get yeah. so foggy. My brain just, I just lose it. Yeah. I can't yeah. function. And, and I, someone told me it was because I was detoxing. But it's hard to say. There's a like, fine line between detoxing and, the, and a reaction, too. So you just yeah. have to be careful, right? Your body, may, but from just from doing algae. So it's hard algae, to say. Plankton, plankton algae, algae. Yeah. Anything, but anything. detoxing does make you feel kind of crummy for a little while. We call it a Herxheimer reaction, where you actually you're, you're mobilizing junk or endotoxins, and it can cause a little bit of inflammation, which can make your typically can makes your current symptoms a little bit worse. But how you know it's a detox reaction is it should get better, you know. But if it doesn't get better within a week or two, then you know it's probably more likely a reaction. So I, I literally can't function. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Case. I can't yeah. close the door yeah, I don't remember where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything about the coconut oil. Yeah, MC, so MCT, I'm glad that you mentioned that. So MCT oil is derived from coconut, but it's great for the brain. So it's a healthy fat, it's a medium chain triglyceride, that's where the MCT comes from. But I do it every day, I think it's great, and uh, it's good brain fuel. So where the ketogenic diet works for cognitive function, we know that the brain it functions much more efficiently. The mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouses for the cells in your body, function more efficiently when they use ketones for fuel as opposed to the sugar. And ketones come from your body breaking down fat for energy. And to get to that point, though, you have to have low sugar. You have to have a low carb diet. So your body says, hey, there's not quite enough sugar here. There's not enough carbs here to keep me going. So we're going to start burning fat for energy. And that's where the keto diet comes into play. But you've got to be careful with it because it's not for everybody. Yeah. So you're saying so you're saying that taking coconut oil internal is good, but mm -hmm. what about the whole thing about well the fat that hardens, therefore it's bad? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think coconut oil, for, it's again, there's no blanket answers here because everybody is unique, everybody's different. Saturated fat, 
which is from coconut, can be inflammatory for some people, but it can be beneficial for others. So that's where it's important to use your markers and look at your inflammation and see how it reacts to your body. I mean, it's the same with drugs, right? One person will do amazing on a pharmaceutical, the next person will be in the hospital with a reaction. So everything's individualized. You just gotta tread lightly and go slowly and see how your body reacts because there's no perfect treatment for anybody. But I do think medium chain triglycerides, as long as it's not messing up your lipids, your inflammatory markers, are good. You know, my breakfast is uh, MCT oil, collagen, and and, uh, and coffee, and, and you know, um, uh, reishi coffee. I love it, and it's good, and I stay full, at, you know, until the morning. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things you can do to run off of uh, fat and fuel your body and your brain more efficiently. Yeah, I uh, have been using. Um, Lion's mane. Oh, it's great, yeah. Or, and I do find that when I run out, I'm, I'm um, yeah. my memory gets worse. So there's, mushrooms are kind of up and coming too. You're hearing a lot more about, you know, mushrooms, and I think there's a lot of benefits. There. There's a lot of good research between lion's mane and reishi and some of these other things. Shaga. Like, yeah, shaga, you know, and that's everywhere here, so that's great. But, um, what's reishi coffee? So they actually make coffee now that has real coffee. You know, organic is what you want, but it has reishi mushroom in it, which is anti-inflammatory. So, you get lots of new stuff with mushrooms that they're putting in. That Four right. Sigmatic is a good brand. Yeah, yeah. that's a great brand, yeah. Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic. Another one is uh, Organo Gold. You just gotta get their organic blend. But Four Sigmatic, I really like them. They're great, so. F-O-U-R, S-I-G-N-A-T-S. Did you say you said the guy was the one? Uh, oh yes, yes. So like when my if my kids get bit and the tick is engorged or we're not sure if it was just there or not, then we'll set it off to tick to tick testing. Um, it is called uh, gosh, drawing a blank on the name. It's like I think it's something like tick test or you know it's out of Massachusetts. There's one out of Massachusetts and uh, they're really quick. It's 50 bucks to test the tick, but it tells you if it has Lyme or some of the main co-infections like Babesia, Babesia and Olympia anaplasma. So it's a great thing to do if you've been bit, because that's really helpful from a treatment standpoint. So if someone comes into my clinic and they, you know, they are bit by a tick and they're symptomatic, and if we have that test, we know, you know, what bugs we need to be looking for and testing for, as opposed to running the whole gamut of tests. So it's a great thing to get familiar with. Ashwagandha. Yeah. If I do you think it makes me feel good? Is there anything wrong with it? Or are you I can't give you any medical advice, but you know, I, I do utilize ashwagandha in my practice. Uh, but it is, you know, it's nice. Some people, yeah, some people do react to it. So you have to be careful, especially with autoimmune issues. You just gotta see how your body reacts. But it's a great adaptogen. It does help. Yeah, it's good for adrenal. Exactly, yeah, so it's an adaptogen in the sense that it, it's supposed to help you when you're stressed or whether you're low. You know, it's just kind of a balancing, I just first of all I want to thank you for yeah, coming yeah, out and yeah, spending, yeah. because like my grandfather died of it, my dad's seventy two, he has it. Yeah. And I'm forty two. Yeah. And I that. you know, there's doctors like yourself, functional mm -hmm. medicine practitioners who can actually heal people. Yeah. Um, I started with end of Alzheimer's, Dale Bredesen, his recall protocol. Yeah. Is amazing. It is. There's a couple other doctors and books that are very helpful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tom O'Brien, yep. he has a book called You Can Fix Your Brain. Yep. He's all he's all over um, Facebook and social media, and yep. he's really helpful. And then, um, have you read Genius Foods yet by Max Lugano? No, I haven't, I haven't. Is that good? Really good. Um, Hyman's got some good stuff out too. Yeah, Hyman, Perlmutter. Yeah, Hyman, Perlmutter's another great book, Brain Brain. You know, Wheat Belly is another good one. You know, again, there's different books. You know, there's all sorts of things. Anthony cool Williams, have you heard of him? Yeah, I have heard of him, yes. And, and, but if you get, like, Audible, I'm a huge Audible fan, so I'm always listening to books. I mean, for whatever it is a month, 10 bucks a month or something, you can just get book after book after book, and it's just, there's so many good books out there that really can expand your knowledge and understanding of all of this stuff. And I would encourage you, from a functional medicine standpoint, another great book, is called The Disease Delusion by Jeffrey Bland. That's a really good book just talking about where healthcare is at and what needs to happen to get people healthy again. You know, and I think it's just good to spread the word on that book because it's just such good information. Very what powerful. Was his name? Uh, Jeffrey Bland. Yes? This is a question that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you in the beginning. Sure. Um, it has to do with Alzheimer's. My understanding is you cannot tell if someone has Alzheimer's. 
when dead when you examine the brain. Yeah, so I mean, that's why it's a clinical diagnosis, right? That's typically what it is. Because looking at imaging, there's subtle clues on an MRI where you're looking at volumetrics on the, the, of the size of like your hippocampus, for example, which is suggestive. But truly, Alzheimer's, you know, I mean, that's where you know definitively that's there by doing a biopsy and looking for the, the tangles and looking at the beta amyloid plaque. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but there's subtle, you know, the, the clinical presentation is, you know, I mean, that's why even when someone gets an Alzheimer's diagnosis, you still want to, you know, look, do a comprehensive evaluation, make sure that that's what it is. Because sometimes, just like with everything, you know, once you get a diagnosis, it's kind of left alone, right? Where, okay, that's what it is, we're not going to really look any further. But, you know, just like with autoimmunity and MS and different things, you know, you want to be thinking about just making sure you're not crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's so you're not missing them. Right? And then there's heading. Head injury is huge. So again, when you look at Bredesen's stuff, he's talking, you know, again, that's a big risk factor. You know, if for cognitive decline in general or any neurodegenerative disease is concussion and, and head injuries. You know, so if, you know, that's where you just gotta be careful with kids and sports and stuff. You gotta be proactive with protecting them uh, because it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that, that sets off a whole cascade of inflammation that can hang around. I talked to a lot of people with other disease processes where the trigger was an injury, you know, a traumatic brain injury. So it's, yeah, protect your body. Take care of it now, so you know, protect it later. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Um, yeah. So they uh, yeah. could say maybe you don't have Alzheimer's, but you may have a head injury. You may have a head injury, yeah. But you know, if the, the head injury, if I the- I forget what it's called. Uh, concussion. A concussion? Yeah. GBI, traumatic brain injury, yeah. So there's different levels of that because that can mess you up in various ways, right? A lot of people with, you know, head injuries, guess what they get? Gut issues too. You know, we see that a lot. I'm wondering if people, if they're having Alzheimer's, and they have history, yeah. Yeah, history is important too. You know, history is really important. That's why we sit down and I know we talk to people for 80 minutes at our first visit, just going from history from birth up in the present day and trying to paint that picture of what's happened, when symptoms started, and what some of those triggers might have been. But the history is super important. That's why you got to spend time with your doctor and make sure they're well informed. Mm -hmm. Just I want to go back to the whole thing. Yeah. Because um, I'm just wondering about that, like how much of a factor is that more of a um, so mold is inflammatory. Response. Yeah, mold's a big it's issue. Stacking. Exactly for a lot of people, you know. But it's just it's like Lyme, you know, kind of in the same word. Some I, I personally feel a lot of times when you go to a Lyme doctor, they see Lyme. When you go to a mold doctor, they see mold. <laughs> when you go to a thyroid doctor, it's your thyroid. You know, so you need to keep an open mind and you need to look at the big picture. And mold, you know, again, story is important. History is important. When things change, you know, did you start getting sick when you had that roof leak, or did you get sick when you moved to that? new apartment, you know, that history piece is important. Do you feel better when you go on vacation? You know, is your health significantly improved? So that matters, but there's also, you know, testing that you can do on yourself. There's actually a cool test you can do at home that is called a VCS test. It's a visual um, contrast screen, and you can get that at survivingmold.com. It's like $15. Now this, I want to start off by saying, this is not a perfect test, so if it's positive, you don't want to freak out and think you have a mold issue, but I use this a lot in the clinic as a uh, first step because what we know with mold and biotoxins is that they bind to your optic nerve and that can affect your visual uh, contrast. Not acuity, but contrast. So differentiating different shades of gray. So if you fail this test, it means you have a problem with contrast, which could suggest some kind of biotoxin illness and mycotoxins from mold, which are volatile gases, molds, certain molds produced from water damaged buildings can contribute to that, but other things can as well. So just because it failed doesn't mean you have a mold issue, but that's a good starting point. And then there's urine tests that you can do, there's allergy profiles you can do, just to solidify that, because you don't want a mold issue. <laughs> you know, if you don't have to have one, right? It's, it's a disaster as far as remediation goes, and you want to be 100% sure that that's an issue if you're going to go down that, or not 100%, you can't be, but pretty sure. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Let me stay excited. Um, <laughs> So let's say, <laughs> let's say I, and my, I brought my dad to yeah, see you, yeah. he's 72. Mm -hmm. um, like, what, 
type of, you know, do you have any patients that have cognitive decline? Yeah, oh uh, yeah. I you know, so like, yes. But it's not, it's not always, you know, I have a lot of patients, I had one today with Alzheimer's, new diagnosis. But, um, you know, there's various stages too. So I get a lot of patients, you know, in that 40 to 60 range where they are struggling cognitively. They may not have a diagnosis yet, but, you know, they are definitely heading in that direction. So let's say at 72, yeah, right? Yeah. Like what, you do the assessment and you run yeah. all the tests. Yeah. Like what are one or two things that he could start doing mm -hmm. that could start to tip the tides? Yeah, because I think the big thing is that moving, removing inflammatory foods is huge. You know, getting rid of all processed sugars, all processed junk, really focusing on a plant-based diet, high in fat, lean protein, I think that's essential. Exercise, very, very important. You know, get it, fit, working with a trainer, it is worth the investment to work with a professional to figure out what you need to do. You know, because I'm guilty, I don't know what I'm doing at the gym, you know, that's why I have a trainer who tells me what I need to do and I go and do it, because my time is valuable just like everybody else's is. So I want to make sure that when I go, I'm getting something out of it. So you know, working with a trainer or at least someone who's going to be able to help you develop a routine, being proactive with that is important. Um, and then again, you know, looking at nutrition, looking at inflammation, doing like some of these brain activities and exercises, all of that's really important too. Now, do you do you sort of walk him along, walk your patients along with the nutrition, or is there yeah. a nutritionist or both, you, both that you sort of because? Yep. You know, so I kind of head, I kind of head oversee, you know, the nutrition piece and make the initial suggestions, and then we have a nutritionist and a health coach in our clinic that help walk them through that. And then, of course, we're always regrouping every single appointment. I'm asking people about the five foundational five because those are essential. You know, you gotta sleep, you gotta eat, you gotta relax, you gotta move, and you gotta detox. And you. Um it's, I think I've been on your site before. You, you, there's, insurance doesn't cover. They right? don't, unfortunately. So, no, what, yeah. like, so what would like a six month engagement cost? So, um, it, <laughs> I, I don't think I can actually talk about that here, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Education, you know. So, right. But everything's on my website. Everything's on the website. Okay. <laughs> Any questions, guys? <laughs> Sorry, man. No, that's okay. <laughs> Any questions? No? Well, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Good luck. Thank you. Stay healthy. All right? If you have a sign here, you can Yeah. Why does the potato have to be cooked? Uh, <laughs> cool. You want to hear the problem? So, 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 so you can hot potato by itself. It, it breaks down as a starch very quickly, whereas when you cool it down, it becomes more resistant. So it travels through the uh, intestine further before it starts to get broken down. I don't know for sure, but it's weird. It works.